Thank you very much, Dr. Cockrell. And before I begin my talk, uh, read my paper, I want to make a couple of simple points. The first, the first point is that uh, I'm here as a psychiatrist to set certain points about the science of behavior, and particularly behavior related to sexuality, that are often uh, misunderstood or not taken into account in decisions that uh, people are making about matters um, uh, 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 of this sort. The second thing is that I'm a doctor and therefore not here to talk about and identify right and wrong and point out sort of things, but rather to talk about the nature of matters and how an understanding of that nature might help in dealing with decisions over matters of right and wrong. And finally, the third thing I want to say is I'm reading this paper. And that's a problem for listeners. It comes, there are two problems about it. One is that uh, you tend to get so absorbed that you don't notice what your audience is doing. And secondly, you tend to read too fast. And so especially when you have a subject that, in a, in a matter that has material um, that intends at least to have a logical structure to it, you can lose the audience that way too. So if I start reading too rapidly, holler out, just say, slow down, slow down. Well, I, we, we, get, we got a lot of time here and uh, I'm prepared to talk, uh, read off this paper and then we can have some questions and answers a afterwards. And I gather we've, we've, it says here that we can be here uh, right out till 9.15. And uh, if, you, if I hold your attention and get, you, get the points across, we'll have accomplished the start to this interesting conference we're having here. Okay? So the, the, the paper is entitled A Challenge to Received Opinion. And it begins by saying there is a received opinion about homosexual behavior today namely that gays are gay by nature, that homosexual behavior is wholly innate tendency, such as left-handedness, and that any attempt to hinder its expression or burden its participants is tantamount to racism. This opinion has led to widespread efforts to alter many institutions and social traditions, especially efforts at identifying um, moral, uh, moral strictures uh, uh, as erroneous and perhaps burdensome. Uh, these efforts, if successful, will have long-lasting effects on our society. It's my view that this opinion, this received opinion, is unproven and quite unsettled in that biologic, psychologic and social studies are not only inadequate to sustain that opinion, but that in many ways these data tend to refute it. I plan here to make this case and then consider what social actions the unsettled nature of this matter implies. Okay. The idea to begin with, I'm going to go biological, psychological, and social in that order and go over some of the interesting material that's out there that you can read about and often see reference to in, uh, uh, in the newspaper. The idea that homosexuality is biologically built in appears commonly in the news and usually makes brief reference to data tied to genes, to brain nuclei, and to nerve connections within the brain. The biological champions of this built-in view do, of course, face the most obstinate of biological facts, namely the anatomy of the human body, where the parts are so suited for heterosexual congress that they encourage the functional conclusion that other uses of these parts, especially homosexual uses, are, are if you pardon the expression, ways of mishandling them. But what of the genes that we hear so much about? Genes seem the ultimate sources of essences and nature, 
and therefore are relevant to our consideration. Several data sets demonstrate that 50% of identical twins, one of whom is uh, homosexual, share, that is, are concordant for the homosexual preference. And in some rare families, a genetic influence promoting male homosexual behavior seems to move through the maternal line associated with a marker on the, on the X chromosome. Actually, geneticists refer to this position as XQ28. This genetic influence does not mendelize in a dominant or recessive way, and though therefore is hard to predict, and rather affects some, but not a predictable proportion of the men carrying this marker in the families. Now what should we make of these data, the, uh, this information of twins and uh, this? I think the data certainly do demonstrate that some genetic influences are in play and can act at many levels in relationship to homosexuality, such as by producing subtle effects on the brain or bodily structure so as to influence a person's temperament, interests and emotional responses to life events, and also to affect that person's physical appearance and attractiveness to others. But notice two important points. First, the genetic identity of monozygotic twins, they all share the same DNA, does not bring uniformity in this behavior as it would for a wholly heritable trait such as eye color. The 50% discordance means that half the people sharing the same genes do not take up homosexual behavior. And even for the concordance rate, 50%, many other human behaviors show similar results in twin studies, and we don't think they're built in nature, such as 50% of uh, or more uh, uh, concordance in monozygotic twins are found in crime, alcoholism, overeating, anorexia nervosa, and uh, we are certainly reluctant to identify these behaviors as natural or obligatory. The twin data and the X chromosome findings indicate that genes do not determine behavior so much as they influence by expanding or contracting a person's range of interests and behaviors. They can incline but not compel through subtle effects on such features as the individual's responsiveness to stimuli such as peer pressure, suggestion, abusive early experiences, drug effects, behavioral rewards and economic opportunities, as well, as I said, as psychophysical capacities and inner drives. Genetic influences on all behaviors, sexual behaviors, social behaviors, interpersonal behaviors, are always indirect and hinge on strengthening or weakening the influence of particular provocative or inhibiting encounters during growth and development. At the most, genes constitute but one of the many influences on a behavior, and probably, if compared with life experiences, far from the most important influence. In fact, science has come full circle here Dean Hammer, the geneticist who demonstrated the X chromosome link I mentioned in a few families, noted the following, quote, about the only human characteristics that seem not to be at least partially heritable are purely learned traits, such as the particular language one speaks or the religion one chooses. He goes on to say that the emerging genetic techniques of DNA sequences and analysis and familiarity with, uh, with the whole uh, genome-wide scans has not and will not, in his opinion, improve our grasp on these matters. In fact, he remarks tellingly, quote, the real culprit is the assumption that the rich complexity of human thought and emotion can be reduced to a simple, linear relation between individual genes and behavior, ignoring the critical importance of the brain, the experienced environment, and gene expression throughout the body. He concludes, quote, what to study is being driven by sociomedical politics rather than by biological logic, 
and human behaviors are the product of intricate networks involving hundreds to thousands of genes working in concert with multiple developmental and environmental events and encounters. A psychiatrist like me <clears throat> quickly notices another problem with much of the genetic biological conce concepts of homosexual preferences as biologically compelled or built in. <clears throat> And what I notice is the habit of many scientists when considering behavior <clears throat> to picture the person as a kind of vacated self, essentially a robot, a zombie, at the mercy of the mechanical controls over his brain and body. These scientists seem certainly these seem inadequate when compared, <clears throat> these concepts seem inadequate when compared to the sense of human choices. <clears throat> And the situations confronted in life, and the way people talk about how they approach these matters of choice and decision. But moving from biology, what does psychology actually teach about the self? The conscious, choosing, reflecting self that is influenced by life experiences, and how might that knowledge permit us to comprehend homosexuality or to confirm from its evidence <clears throat> that it should be deemed virtually normal or built in. <clears throat> the standard story re <clears throat> recounted to persuade us of the built in nature of these issues is that of an emerging homosexual preference beginning in adolescence. An adolescent who notices a drawer of affection and yearning towards people of the same sex. The attraction comes accompanied by the realization that somehow this feeling is offbeat and it must be hidden from others as something shameful and perhaps sick, a realization that might provoke a period of heterosexual attempts, even including marriage and the conception of children. But then through a serial process of growth and liberation, the homosexual attraction expresses itself physically, a sexual preference is fashioned, the true self emerges from the closet, and life proceeds more appropriately from there. If the rest of us support the person, and the true orientation or identity now revealed. No vacated self driven by genes or brain mechanisms is involved in this psychological story, but rather a subject conscious of its attractions and aware of its decisions and their implications, but now needing support from teachers, parents, and even former spouses, just, as I, just like such people would support a left-handed person freed from an arbitrary hindrance. But it's usually adult homosexuals who tell this story about their emerging experience. Little data is available about how often same-sex yearnings and feelings occur amongst uh, pubertal and post-pubertal adolescents who eventually move into contented heterosexual life as adults. We don't have any data to that effect. That these experiences, though are not uncommon, supports the anecdotes of homosexual experiences in colleges and schools amongst many who later, later live perfectly contentedly homosexually, uh, heterosexually rather. Retrospective stories are particularly unconvincing as justifying explanations of any behavior given that, the, given that we all tend to tell stories of our lives in ways that make sense of the outcomes we wish to uphold. Freud and his followers as psychologists went more deeply into causes and have claimed that certain life experiences carry the psychological power to forge both homosexual attractions and behavior. These generative events that they identify include certain parental relationships, a person too close to his mother, psychologically absent fathers, birth order, and the like, a biased educational experience, single-sex schools, puritanical religious instruction, seduction by an older male, criticism by peers of stance and attitude. And these several causes have had their champions but none have brought forth systematic comparisons with similar experiences that have led to, homo, uh, to heterosexual outcomes. Therefore, limited data and personal bias affect all these psychological conclusion, conclusions. All one can say with confidence from the psychology is that homosexual preferences are likely to com come about as a result of experience during one's formative years. Pinning down the generating experiences has proven 
more difficult. They probably vary from case to case and relate to aspects of temperament, attitude, exposure, or seduction, again, in exactly the same way that life experiences and social clustering play generative roles in producing criminals, anorexics, cigarette smokers, the obese, alcoholics, and drug addicts. We should be cautious as to claims of caution and certainly claims as to the underlying nature of the matter at hand. Noticeably missing is close study of the plain sexual interests and preoccupations of people developing a homosexual preference so as to consider whether these differ from those of heterosexuals. <clears throat> Many students of sexuality have noted what I have come to call the phallicism, the phallism of, of male homosexuals as contrasted with the affectionate longing of female homosexuals. Roger Scruton, in his book Sexual Desire, noted that these features were immortalized in the amphorae of the homosexually tolerant ancient Greeks, where it displayed for admiration the prominent phallises of the satyrs, and he contrasted these depictions with the fervor for tenderness found in the sapphic lyrics. <clears throat> Perhaps these distinctions are actually embedded in the male and female psychological constitution, however behaviorally expressed. Just the fact that you see them among the homosexuals doesn't mean that they're not also found among heterosexuals. Little systematic work has, been, has proceeded here, and psychiatrists interested in the conscious mental world from which motivated behavior emerges are unable to decide whether in studying such aspects of homosexual behavior, they are studying homosexuality itself, or basic differences in the sexual natures of men and women. It would seem simplest to conclude that male and female homosexuals differ, but in the way males and females differ in their approaches to sex in general, even as they, males and females usually satisfy these differing but complementary desires in heterosexual union. Psychiatrists and clinical psychologists observe that extra discord and mental problems are frequent in homosexual uh, uh, unions, and on inspection, often represent exaggerations of problems found in male or female life and in heterosexual mental life, for that marital life, for that matter. For male homosexual couples, the problems derive from sexual adventures with multiple and even anonymous partners common physical aggression between partners and sexually transmitted diseases within the pair. For female couples, the psychological problems mostly derive from dissatisfaction over tenderness and attention, serial searches with successive abandoning of one extended partnership after another, seeking more attentive affection, and depressive reactions to these sequences and the dissatisfactions within them. <clears throat> Two, um, what, what I, I mean to say is that none of these uh, uh, issues are unique to the homosexual, but also found with the heterosexual. Could I have a sip of water, William? Thank you very much. Mm. From a chalice, yeah, but it's water. You'll be happy to know. Mm. 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 <clears throat> <clears throat> Psychological um, uh, studies uh, thus suggest that, uh, that uh, I'm, I lost my place here, two main psychological types do tend to uh, appear amongst adult male homosexuals at any rate. First, a rebel type with antisocial and aggressive characteristics who fails to make, take up common standards of behaviors, including the sexual, and who indulges homosexual and often bisexual activities defiantly. And a second, perhaps more common type, where something seems to obstruct or deflect the development of heterosexual interests without producing obvious other psychosocial problems. These people can, in most other matters, conform their interests and behaviors to the rest of the social and work world. They are noteworthy in being found in all kinds of enterprises and are usually the folk people have in mind when speaking of the virtually normal. They are capable, like a fulfilled uh, heterosexual, of losing all interest in the opposite sex and of settling into life without obvious emotional and behavioral distress. So 
And yet amongst them are those who later abandon their homosexual behavior. All psychotherapists can report such events, usually noting them to occur more frequently and more easily in youth, giving credence to the view that homosexual behavior can be a draw that the young can abandon on maturing. But if a person grows with and establishes a homosexual preference through regular practice and encouragement, the behavior will become more difficult to interrupt, and any attempt at interruption must then be approached from within, but only with a powerful commitment to the effort, a commitment that often depends upon the, mor on the subject's moral or religious motivations. Again, though, none of this is unique to homosexual behavior. All other behaviors that emerge in late childhood or adolescence, such as anorexia nervosa, as I mentioned, are much more easily treated if addressed early in their expression and before a patient becomes with age, habituated to the behavior, and conditioned to the signals and urges that promote it. As with the biogenetic studies, then, psychological research suggests that male and female homosexual preferences represent fixated or deflected forms of, of sexual development, vulnerable with time and practice to become grown in the unigendered direction. Although sexual preferences are ultimately personal and rest upon provocations and vulnerabilities still unappreciated within human psychology, the accumulation of sexual appearance, experience through repeated expressions of a homosexual preference can forge, consolidate behavioral habits and make them seem like nature and be as fixed as think something that could come out in other ways. So that's what we, all we can really get, I think, from the psychology. Perhaps the social sciences could illuminate the subject more than either the psychological or the biogenetic work. I have to say, though, that with the social scientific study of sex in general, and homosexuality just one aspect of it, advocacy and sexual politics have played a stronger role than in the biological or the psychological studies. Politics and social opinion play tremendous roles often in the development of the information that we have. This fact was hidden from sight at first when that strange entomologist Alfred Kinsey stopped collecting gall wasp variations to begin the social study of sex by interviewing people who would describe their sexual lives and experiences to him. It's very important to know that he was a pioneer and really the, one of the first social scientists that really uh, showed um, um, and developed some data that influenced us and is still available to look at. After his collection, though, uh, had exceeded a thousand interviews, he, he found support from major American foundations to continue what he, what he called an empirical, non-judgmental study of just what American men and women were doing sexually. When Kinsey and his colleagues at the University of Indiana published Sexual Behavior in the Human Male in 1948 and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female in 1953, they set America arguing about sex as never before, all of us assuming that we were discussing sound social science. I remember, I was a high school student and we were glued to this stuff. <laughs> Most of the time we were wondering who was keeping up the average because, the, geez, holy cow, it was really something. Kinsey actually was a secular Elma Gantry with all the merchandising, sensationalizing, seductive, and hypocritical features of that model to the emerging permissive hedonism and sexual revolution that followed World War II. As a fervent missionary for this new movement, he gave voice, voice to, in, to venomous hatred towards those he thought represented source of, sources of sexual continence or moral restraint in our culture. These sources, I was amused to read about, he once identified specifically as Judaism, Catholicism, and Irishry. <laughs> 
That, that hit home. That hit home. But Irishry, Judaism, Catholicism, and Irishry, that weird group of people, meaning the Irish, yes. Uh, well, but his science was even worse than his prejudices. Kinsey loaded his data with interviews of members of sexual subcultures that he knew. He made no attempt to balance their influence with other interviewees. Hustlers, exhibitionists, frat men, sexual acrobats, prisoners, sex predators, numbered large amongst his sample, and they produced the hypersexuality of his results that amazed all us high school boys back then in the 50s. For example, he reported that 50% of married men in America had extramarital affairs, that 25% of married women had uh, extramarital affairs, that marriages were often improved by extramarital sex, and that 10% of men had sex exclusively with other men for at least three years of their lives. That was the big 10% number. Now, experienced social scientists, particularly, I, I'm glad to say, at Johns Hopkins, began early to suspect his data. In particular, they identified how Kinsey's choice of fringe groups would skew his results towards exaggerating American sexual activity. He had chosen what epidemiologists refer to as samples of convenience. That is, if you want to study a population, a sample of convenience is to just go out and get people that will really do what you want, will do whatever you want, rather than sample and get the more reluctant ones. <clears throat> you remember that the Alfred Landon, um, uh, that uh, the Literary Digest uh, gave the 1936 election uh, between Roosevelt and Land at the Landon on the basis of polling. It turned out that they used a sample of convenience. They did polls on the telephone. In 1936, there were a lot of people that didn't have telephones, and they all voted for Roosevelt, and none of them were contacted by the Literary Digest. <laughs> That's, what you mean. That's what you mean by a sample of convenience. And uh, Kinsey had his own sample of convenience because he was, you know, he was a great sexual adventurer, and he knew all these characters. He ignored the requirement of social science to use a true probability sample before proclaiming an opinion about, about a population. As you can see from his comment about Judaism, Catholicism, and Irishry, Kinsey was also an ideological bully. He so scandalized scientists by his claims, though, and his editorial assaults on ordinary proprieties. And if somebody said, hey, wait a minute, I, gee, 50% of adulterous, give me a break. He would go, you know, there you go, you know, you're, not, you're not looking at the data, or you must have some kind of funny attitudes. His abuse of critics was so bad that no reputable scientific group wanted to repeat his, his work, even though many were more, knew that more appropriate methods would correct the impressions his book was having on all of us especially that 10% figure for homosexuality. And so it's sad for, for, for years. It was really the only social study that we had, but the AIDS epidemic roused the nation. Then the opinions from Kinsey that had titillated and shocked now alarmed us. A diabolical and deadly virus spread by sexual contact was loose in the land. And though at first it was killing people in the male homosexual subculture, it would if the opinions over the number of people involved in um, promiscuous sex and casual contact with homosexuality generated by Kinsey were correct, rather soon spread to everyone. We needed a real survey using a population-based probability sample, so as to decide whether Armageddon was here and what to do about it. The National Opinion Research Center, NORC, at the University of Chicago, with much more social science work to its credit than ever the Kinsey Institute had, began seeking funds from such sources as the National Institutes of Health in the late 80s for a valid survey of American sexual behavior. 
They had to overcome many obstacles, but particularly the bad reputation sex surveys had with the public and among scientists. Many of our political representatives controlling the federal purse strings thought these surveys encouraged people to think that risky be sexual behavior was normal and even perhaps to try them. They thought that, you know, doing sexual surveys represented moral hazards of getting, you know, like those high school kids, geez, if this is what's happening, boy, I have some fun ahead of me. And so they were very reluctant to, to give money for doing it again. They thought, geez, it, they might, if it was 10% with Kinsey, it might be 20% now, and who knows, what are we doing? And they, the Knock Group had a lot of trouble, and they never got a complete funding from the NIH, but the relentless progress of the AIDS epidemic and the need to prepare the nation for a possibly huge disaster broke down much of the resistance, and the study found funds not as much as they would have liked, and the study was done, and in 1994, 46 years after Kinsey's first book, two important publications appeared from NORC. One entitled The Social Organization of Sexuality is a large tome full of data intended to be read by members of the research community, and Sex in America, a smaller book written for the public describing in accessible language just what they had learned and just what the data were in ways that you could access without being a social scientist yourself. Actually, Sex in America is available, about 16 bucks on Amazon, and uh, I'm not sure whether it's on the Kindle, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a book that's worth reading, Sex in America. They represent results that controvert most of Kinsey's uh, results, and because these, their results derived from a clear probability sample of the American population between the ages of 18 and 59, they can be trusted. And from this work, first of all, came information that most people are not having multiple sexual partners. Rather, 85% of Americans have one or no sex partner in a given year. And, 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 and this is the reason why AIDS didn't sweep through our nation. And homosexuals do not number 10% of our male population, but somewhere between 2 and 4%, depending on definition. And these results have been replicated by other smaller studies, both here and abroad. I mention this work because I think everybody who's at all interested in, in, um, in the study of sexual behavior, the social science, should know about the NORC work. And, Interesting, although, although the Kinsey report swept the nation, very few people know about this, and, uh, and, and yet they're, they're, it's very interesting and worthwhile. They provide, though, some of the best data challenging the view that homosexuality is a built-in, biologically-based trait like left-handedness. If that were true, then being biologically based the trait should be randomly and uniformly distributed in the population. In contrast, the NOC study revealed a remarkable difference in rates of male homosexual behavior amongst individuals who lived their adolescence in rural as against large metropolitan cities in America. Whereas only 1.2% of males with rural adolescents had a male sexual partner in the year of the survey, those with a metropolitan adolescents were close to four times more likely to have had such an encounter. They went up to 4.4 to 4.5 percent. Similarly, amongst female homosexuals, women who attended college after high school are much more frequent amongst lesbians than those who do not. These social data support the view that environments in which people mature, and thus the experience and social clusters to which they are exposed, is more crucial to their sexual behavior than most aspects of their biology, as far as we can tell. More, a higher proportion is related to that. And again, this is true for smoking, for obesity. It is one of the important kinds of research, social research being done now in, um, in uh, behavioral studies is the social cluster work that was first done in places like the Framingham study, showing that you tend to smoke if a close friend tends to smoke, and if your close friends don't smoke, then you don't smoke. 
likewise for obesity and other kinds of things. The social cluster research is very important, and one of the first places that it became evident was in the NORC study in relationship to homosexuality. And so much, so much then for the bio, uh, biological, the psychological, and the social studies. So, how, what, about, what about the problem itself? There are certainly serious functional problems in our society that, uh, that uh, come with homosexual preferences. Many of them are the social fallout of the psychological unrest uh, that I, I mentioned before and derived from the psychological variance within female, male and female sexuality mentioned above the assertive phallicism so strong in males and the affectionate longing so strong and central to females. Not only are these related but complementary interests satisfied in heterosexual unions, their excesses are to a considerable degree restrained, a restraint that shapes the pairing, making wives for husbands and husbands for wives in a fashion that supports the collective life of the union itself, it seems, and of the societies and communities in which it, Im it is embedded. It may well be that the heterosexual combination of satisfactions and restraint, the heterosexual combination of satisfactions and restraint stabilizes, uh, tames, if you will, domesticates, if you'd like, the union, sheltering it from the vociferous potential of human sexual hungers so as to make for families devotional persistence and sanctuary for members linked within the unit, particularly its children. Certain communities especially identify loss of parents as a grievous social injury produced by homosexuality. In particular, African Americans note that homosexual preferences will add to the many other matters removing black males from the pool of fathers of families and thus as guiding protectors for black children as they grow into adulthood. A concern about parenting children for the next generation is not restricted to minority groups. Of course, the the promiscuity in multiple sexual partners of male homosexual behavior was a major public health matter and a source for transmission of sexual diseases, including AIDS. And yet the conclusion that these statistical and functional observations indicate that homosexuality is a problematic behavior is today unacceptable. The gay community, one of the most powerful of contemporary advocacy groups, Hold that the purposes of society are satisfied by a homosexual career as much as a heterosexual one, and that any consideration of homosexuality as socially problematic is a vicious attitude itself. It is believed to be, is often said to be a result of homophobia, another presumptive mental illness to which the ignorant, powerful, and narrow-minded are vulnerable. This is kind of the, the Jewish, Judaism, Catholicism, Irishry theme again that you hear uh, uh, often from the, 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 the gay pro, uh, programs. How these views uh, succeeded uh, and, and did so so quickly uh, in, in our culture is, is a lesson, again, in contemporary politics more than one in science. Politics played out in the realm of the sociologist and played out rather successfully uh, over the last 15 years as it became clear from the AIDS epidemic that these advocates for homosexual uh, life could not move from biological and psychological arguments to um, uh, insist that uh, and persuade people that homosexual life was uh, not only natural but functionally safe. Much of the previously advertised and celebrated ways of gays, uh, such as multiple and anonymous pa sexual partners, this all happened before the gay, uh, before AIDS. You remember there was a, a lot of uh, um, um, joy or celebration about this in gay parades and the like. The, the bodily invasive practices celebrated in the Maplethorpe photos along with the vigorous defense in the life of lifestyle of the bathhouse centers for anonymous sex in Boston and San Francisco, despite the AIDS raging amongst their visitors, served only to identify a wild and abandoned even fanatical character to their behavior. This, is, this had to be changed and in fact Marshall Kirk and Hud Hunter Madsen in their book, After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s, proposed that homosexuals should repackage themselves for the public, not as people who are way out, but as victims of society and disease, and in the process, process abjure offensive displays of 
avoid offensive displays of their differences. These three methods have been spelled out in a useful book by Anne Hill Hendershot called The Politics of Deviance. And uh, uh, the methods suggested by Kirk and Madsen now employed um, uh, to, uh, to support these, the view that any uh, attempt to propose that homosexuals are anything but built in and virtually normal. The first is, the fir there are three methods now in the, that are being used. The first is desensitization, presenting homosexuals unthreatening and inoffensive. They're your neighbors, your friends, your teachers all around, so as to support referring to them as victims of discrimination. The second is jamming, the effort to make critics of homosexuality ashamed by depicting them as homo-hating bigots, mentally ill deviants, homophobic uh, ideologues, and jamming is vigorously pursued on co college campuses today where any critical comments over homosexuality can be punished as hate speech and any faculty member's reluctance to wear the pink triangle and support gay and lesbian week can lead to tenure sanctions. Finally, the third method involves effort at conversion, attempts to do more than to do more than gain grudging tolerance for homosexuals, but to win some enthusiasm for the identity. This method advises homosexuals against depicting themselves as outrageous queens and dykes, sashaying in boas and pumps in gay pride parades, but as with defenses like other minorities showing that there's somebody you'd like to know, and they are. This plan was a piece with the other attacks on the idea of deviance in social studies. It is now most evident in the push for tolerance encouraging sex education in grammar schools and education on anatomy, physiology, and homosexual practices, but often ignoring the need for virtues such as devotion, duty, sacrifice, and self-mastery in the very arena of life where many people, uh, where for many people they first, these, these virtues first become real. By making it seem hard-hearted, advocates break down the public's um, uh, preference for heterosexual life. In conclusion, I'm, I'm just unpersuaded that homosexuality is built in uh, 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 and should be considered as built in from conception. The case has not been made by any of the pertinent sciences, and the conscious public, um, uh, 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 and, and, and the conscious public uh, working with contemporary advocates of that position, and the, the, the hard work that they're doing to build up the public relations uh, in doing so makes me even more certain that it, the data doesn't rest on secure, telling, biologic, psychological, or social evidence that would uh, persuade anybody. It needs this extra energy to get people to take, take it, it seemed to me. But what, in, what, what implications does that conclusion draw if you, if you don't think that it's sort of built in but is shaped by life we should, in my opinion, we should discourage thinking about people with homosexual preferences as a kind. One can discuss the behavior and its attractions and its, the way it fulfills some people's lives, the development of its expression, and the social and psychological issues involved in a life devoted to homosexual behavior without any assumption that we're discussing a subtype of human being or a particular race of humankind. One can hold that homosexual preference is an organized sexual interest, drawing people with similar preferences into, a, into, into the life without claiming that the people form a subspecies. We can, acknowledge, we can certainly acknowledge that these people have, been, have in the past been publicly injured and humiliated for their choices and decisions, and we should condemn that abuse of them. Private sexual acts between consenting adults, if discreetly conducted, and acknowledges matters of personal morality over which the mediating institutions of a culture may express concern and dismay but not legally control, should certainly not be subject to, to government penalties. Also, we should oppose discriminating against people with this preference in most arenas of human enterprise, such as work or housing and the like. The legal sanctions against these acts in private settings that have fallen away of late should not be restored. Justice and experience both support this position. The removal of oppressive laws along with the recognition of previous mistreatment 
has helped produce a salutary emergence of geniality towards people with homosexual preference that has been good for everyone and hardly something to think of reversing. Most of us, anyone who's had the experience that I have had uh, over time, can recognize that life in America has become better. Collegiality has improved in the office and the professions, and the sense of amiability in the community enriched because of the reduction in social odium previously carried by these unfortunate people. But when I say that, this doesn't mean, though, that exhibiting this behavioral preference may not justifiably concern people, or some people, and that commitment to it promoting its expression may not be detrimental to legitimate social aims of others, and that these arenas so, so suitably resisted. And this is, this is where it gets touchy. Begin with the military. People with homosexual preference might well, if they act on this preference, disrupt the purposes and morale of an army group or a warship. The do not ask, do not tell policy, particularly if rooted in the rejection of the idea of kind and attending simply to behavior, just saying this is a behavior, has advantages. It does not involve a search to the private attractions and preferences of people, but it re does reject from service anyone who actively displayed or wished to promote the behavior. The leadership should not ask, are you a homosexual? But simply stress the following, homosexual behavior will impede the unit and we can't and won't permit it. And then what are the mediating institutions separate from the government? The churches, the schools, the youth groups such as Boy Scouts or, or other fraternal societies that identify human development and personal flourishing with heterosexual development and traditional marriage. Surely such enterprises with those commitments can legitimately deny directorial and leadership positions to, the whole, to, the, to those who hold that a homosexual endpoint is just as suitable and might even be championed. Again, it's not a matter of intolerance. It's a matter of incompatibility. The aims, purposes, indeed the expectations built into such mediating institutions, the very matters that give them purpose as culturally stabilizing kith and kin institutions, are and have in their wisdom for centuries been contrary to the life goals of homosexual individuals. Those seeking the goals of gay liberation should seek other institutions and other platforms for their efforts. If one cannot agree that the, with the shared uh, standards and goals, then one surely cannot complain when one is excluded from leading those institutions committed to those standards and goals. We can legitimately oppose other radical social changes proposed by gay advocates. We shouldn't be using terms such as homophobia, disciple, uh, 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 the, uh, criticism of the gay movement, or encourage homosexual behavior in youth. We shouldn't be teaching the copulatory techniques of homosexual union, or, by the way, or heterosexual union for that matter, to grammar and high school students. I got through high school perfectly well without having a sex education class. We shouldn't support gay and lesbian clubs in schools that may encourage social clustering that could be provocative of uh, later behavior and put forward the flawed idea that common feelings of adolescent sexual arousal, attraction, and confusion always indicate homosexual orientation and that simultaneously strive, as these clubs do, to persuade a student that little of moment is at stake in the outcome. A lot is at moment in the stake in this outcome, and we should make that clear to people. Finally, we shouldn't permit the government to reorganize a traditional social institution such as marriage to a common same-sex couples, I believe. Such government action will carry far more damaging implications to the integrity and coherence of marriage uh, uh, as well as the future of the family than any advantage it brings to its advocates. I agree that many social requests made, though, by these, those with homosexual preferences and often sustained by others concerning justice and fairness uh, of um, economic support and the like do identify issues that in themselves need the fullest discussion and fair, fair outcome. They include such issues as the goals of education and the socio-cultural community-enriching purposes realized in marriage. But a call for calm and respectful discourse over these matters sometimes tends to fall on deaf ears 
especially in the universities, where surprisingly the claims for feelings appear to trump any turn to reason. A good beginning would be to restudy the masses of sociology such as Emil Durkheim and note why they thought the concepts of deviance seemed obvious and even inevitable within any society that hoped to be coherent, life-promoting, and sustained. We also should free up psychiatrists to make clear that the nature of the disagreements in this vex area and collect more information about the psychology of sex, especially to do so by caring for people who asked about these, about correction of these preferences and habits when they ask for help. And that's what I think. Thank you very much. <laughs>